The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. The word of God, which also performs its work in you who believe. Blessed are those who hear the word of God and observe it. We are here this morning to study in the Word of God, and hopefully you have the notes for today's class. We are on a new topic after all these weeks that we have been studying in the Dispensations and Ages. This morning we are going to begin a study on the covenants. It's appropriate that we would follow up our study on the Dispensations and Ages with a study of the covenants, and there's two reasons why we're doing that. It's a perfect follow-up to that, and secondly, that's what comes in the book that we're using as our outline, the Chafer book, the Walvard edited Chafer book on major Bible themes. We will get to our study on that here in a minute, but it's important that before we sit down to study the Word of God that we are in fellowship, that we're filled with the Holy Spirit so that He can minister to us and lead us into the truth. It's also important, as we were singing about in the hymns, that we ask that our eyes and our ears and our heart might be opened so that we can understand the truths of God's Word and This would be more than simply some kind of an academic study, but instead this would be vivid and real to us that we might learn these lessons and live according to them. So let's pray together now. Gracious Heavenly Father, you have given us another day, and your mercies are renewed day by day. And we're thankful for the opportunity we have today to study your word and to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We ask that you would set aside distractions, that you would remove any kind of an impairment from our own thinking that would prevent us from understanding the truth of your word, or that you would open up these things and help us to understand them. Give us that understanding we need in order to have these things implanted in our souls. Father, we ask that your word would be a light for our lives, not just some book that we're reading, not just some academic study, but instead that it would be a light to our lives. That these things would be so real and so vivid to us that we would think of them constantly and that we would live according to what we've learned. Father, we pray these things in Jesus Christ, most precious and holy name. Amen. Well, before we jump into the major Bible themes study itself, I wanted to do a minor follow-up to our Dispensations and Ages material. The reason I want to do that is because I had a question after class last week, and the question had to do with the, uh, it had to do with the time of the millennium, whether or not uh, there would be generations in the millennium, because the question was asked, why is it that... uh, there's generations of, of people in the millennium when we're looking at resurrected saints. But remember, it's important to recognize that, uh, and I'll just draw this on here, that when we go through the, the tribulational time period, right, the first thing that happens, we have the first event that we're looking forward to. Hang on, let me make it better than that. We have, it's not much better, is it? We have the rapture event that takes place. The rapture event... We have Christ coming down. We have the, the raising up of the, the dead in Christ. We have those who are alive at the time being transformed. And those individuals go up to meet Christ in the air, and then He takes them home. Normally, I just draw the two arrows but, arrows, but it's actually important to remember that third arrow that I just drew, because after we meet Him in the air, He takes us where? He takes us to heaven, to the place that He's prepared for us. That's what He was trying to teach his disciples as he was talking about how he had to go and prepare a place for them. And so this is the idea. Jesus comes down. So Jesus himself comes down. He brings the saints with him, by the way, who've already died. And then there's this this resurrection that happens in terms of the the receiving of the resurrection bodies. And then also the, the saints who are alive and well at the time. We have some drippage going on. The saints that are alive and well, uh, well at the time are then transformed and then uh, those individuals are taken up into the air to meet Christ and then He takes them to the place that He's prepared for them. That means we have a clogged line. I guess, did you get it? Did you, were you able to turn it off? This one, they have separate drain lines, so this one probably will drain okay. 
So this is the rapture event, and sometime after that we have the signing of the covenant, and then after the signing of the covenant we have Daniel's 70th week, right? This is when we have the tribulation. We have the tribulation that takes place, and there's all kinds of the wrath of God that is poured out at that time. But recognize there's going to be believers during the tribulation. After the rapture occurs... There's no, there are no believers on earth, and I know you all are all focused on Gary over there, but after the rapture, after the rapture occurs, there'll be no believers on the face of the earth, but it ain't going to take long until there are believers, and there's going to be plenty of people who believe during the tribulational time period, and even as the wrath of God is poured out, there will be many believers. There's going to be the sealing of the 144,000 Jewish evangelists. There's going to be all kinds of other things that take place. But we're going to get to the end of the, I mean, excuse me, of the tribulation at the second advent of Christ when he comes. He's going to take care, right? We have the Armageddon. We also have the judgments, the sheep and goats judgment, the wilderness judgment. At that point in time, after he's finished, there's no unbelievers left on the planet. But we have a whole group. But this is what I wanted to highlight for you here before we move on. We have a whole group of believers that are in their mortal bodies. Because remember that, me, that we as resurrected saints, and the Old Testament saints for that matter, remember there's the resurrection of the Old Testament saints, right? We have the Old Testament saints in their resurrection bodies. We have the church, the bride of Christ, in their resurrection bodies. All of these, all of these are in their resurrection bodies. Whoops. Kind of messed up there, but that's all right. You understand what it is. The, the, all these people are in their resurrection bodies. But you have a whole group of believers who survived to the end of the tribulation. They made it all the way to the end of the tribulation. And these believers are the ones who will be in their mortal bodies who will be procreating during the millennium. And that's why there will be generation after generation of those who who uh, obviously move further away from God as there's generations being born. There are those who move further away from God. Now, the lifespans increase during the millennial kingdom. That's one of the things we didn't really highlight, but we will in our eschatology study. The lifespans will increase so that someone who dies at 100 years of age would have, would have died young. That all happens in the millennial kingdom, but yet there's still, there's still children being born. But just recognize that we have on the planet at that time an interesting situation because you have people in their resurrection bodies and you have people who are still in their mortal bodies. And those ones in their mortal bodies, those are the ones who are reproducing because we in our resurrection bodies do not reproduce. We are like the angels in that sense, that we do not reproduce. Did I need to pull that table out so it doesn't get dripped on? We'll just let it drip on the floor. We can always mop up the floor, right? Yeah. So uh, I was praying for no distractions, and here we have a distraction. <laughs> I have a question about... Yes. Um, you're, you're, we're still going to have the same earth. We're still going to have the same... Earth. This is the old heavens and the old earth. Are we going to have a ladder also going up to heaven? You're resurrected people? I mean, Not at that point in time. When, we're, when we come in, the, the question was, are we going to have the ladder? The idea, the picture of Jacob's ladder. I don't believe that comes until the new heavens and the new <laughs> earth. Because at this point in time, recognize even though we're heavenly people, we will be with Christ reigning on the earth during the millennial kingdom. So will the Old Testament saints who are resurrected also. And so we'll be, we'll be earth, earthbound at that point. Uh, and then, of course, when these, this heavens and this earth are destroyed and the new heavens and the new earth come in, that's when you have this idea. That's where righteousness dwells and that's where we are able to go back and forth between the heaven and the earth. But we are on the earth with Christ during the millennial so kingdom. The unbelievers who were judged in the sheep and goats judgment and in the and in the uh, the wilderness judgment. Well, before I know the lake of fire is the very end of the Yeah, they they are they are judged right there at those judgments. The we the sheep and goats and the wilderness judgments they are judged right there, and they are uh, basically sentenced to the lake of fire. That's what it says. Is they're sentenced to the lake of fire. The lake of fire they aren't cast into the lake of fire until the until the end of the millennium. But they go to Hades or to Sheol or to hell or whatever you want to call it. 
and they stay there until they are cast in the lake of fire, but they're sentenced to the lake of fire right there at the end of the tribulation. So they get their judgment right then and right there. Right then and right there. So, and the unbelievers have already died? Yes. They come, they come, they, get, they are resurrected for their judgment at the great white throne judgment at the, end of the, at the end of the millennium. Yeah, the unbelievers are resurrected. Remember the first resurrection, which is the resurrection that happens, the first resurrection as it's described in, uh, in, the, in Revelation, is this resurrection, which is a resurrection unto life. That's your Old Testament saints. They're resurrected at the beginning of the millennium. There's a second resurrection, which is a resurrection unto death. That resurrection takes place at the end of the millennium and they are resurrected for their judgment at the great white throne. Well, there's a difference between the first fruits and the first resurrection. Remember the first and the last. When you look at the first and the last in scripture, don't always realize don't always assume that the first is the absolute first or that the last is the absolute last. There are a dozen, well, that's probably exaggerating. There are a half a dozen last trumpets and they're different trumpets. The first fruits, that's at the, that's at the first, there were the first fruits when Jesus was resurrected, that's the first fruits there, but in Revelation, when it talks about the first resurrection and the second resurrection, the first resurrection and the last resurrection, the first resurrection is talking about this one here, at the, at the beginning of the first resurrection is this one here at the beginning of the millennium, so it's not the absolute first resurrection, there's already been a resurrection, it's talking about two resurrections, there's the first one and the second one. And so in that context, it's the first one. Yeah, you have to understand the difference in Scripture. That's, that's one of the things we have to kind of pick out of Scriptures is when something talks about first or it talks about last, is it talking about the very last one or just the last one for this particular period of time? And there's many last trumpets. When you talk about the first resurrection in the context of Revelation, and we'll study that when we get there, in the context of Revelation, it's talking about two resurrections. The first one happens before the millennium and the second one happens after. And this thing's actually blowing heat on me at this point, so you can probably just turn it off. <laughs> I can do without that. <laughs> you talk, I'm going to get a little... Get a little uh... Yeah. I won't be sweating because of what I'm teaching. I'll be sweating because of this thing blowing on me. <laughs> so that, hopefully that clears up the idea of the, the generations that occur during the millennium. That t occurs because there's still people in their mortal bodies who are, who are procreating on the planet. And that's, uh, that's going to happen. We won't be. We won't be participating in any, pro, in any procreation, but they will be. The ones who survive the tribulation are still in their mortal bodies and they're still having babies. All right, so we'll get back to our major Bible themes. Hopefully, like I said, does anybody not have the notes? Everybody have the notes for today? Okay, the covenants. That's what we're going to look at today is the covenants. <coughs> Let's first talk about biblical versus theological covenants. This is very important because there are people out there who will talk to you about covenants and they kind of blur things a little bit and confuse things. So we want to make sure we're clear. In addition to the covenants which are mentioned in the Bible, theologians have advanced three inferred covenants. They call them the, they call them the theological covenants. And that's probably not a bad name, but they're derived. They're inferred covenants. First of all, they talk about a covenant of works with Adam in the garden, which asserts that if Adam had obeyed God's prohibition, he would have lived forever. So they call that the covenant of works. Secondly, they have a, the idea of a covenant between God the Father and God the Son, whereby the Son agreed to provide redemption for salvation of mankind, and the Father promised to accept his sacrifice. This is some sort of an inferred covenant. I recognize that word inferred should catch your attention because these are not actual covenants in the Bible. These are covenants that theologians have come up with. So supposedly this agreement took place between God the Father and God the Son. And then there's something known as a covenant of grace with Christ as the mediator of the covenant and representative of those who put their trust in Him. Now is there some truth behind these notion of covenants? There certainly is some truth behind them, but the problem is they're referred to as covenants and they shouldn't be. In order to preserve doctrinal clarity, we will focus our study on the covenants explicitly mentioned in Scripture. So rather than get into a theological discussion with people deriving their own covenants, we're going to talk about the covenants which are in Scripture. Now, covenants are very important. Covenants are very important 
It's very important to understand the kind of covenants that are made and what God does when He makes a covenant with people. But we also need to make sure that we don't place too much importance on covenants because some people take covenants to the nth degree and they make them so important that they dominate the Scripture. And in fact, uh, what you have, and it's a convention of naming that we've used for years now when we have the idea of the Old Testament and the New Testament that really speaks of covenants, the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. Uh, there's a lot of people who talk about covenants and make them the predominant theme in Scripture. The predominant theme in Scripture is what? What is, what is the whole purpose of creation itself? What's the point of all the things that we learn? It's actually all about the glory of God. It's about Him being glorified. It was made by Him and through Him and for Him. It is to glorify God's Son, Jesus Christ. That's the whole point of Scripture. So we don't want to elevate, we don't want to, I guess the best way to say it is we don't want to create our own hierarchy of what's critical and important and put covenants above things that are just as important, if not more important, than the covenants. But covenants are important, don't get me wrong. So we're going to study them, the biblical covenants. The covenants of God contained in Scripture fall into two distinct categories, conditional and unconditional. This is critical in your understanding. Just as important as it, is, as it was, and I should, have made a, I should have made a bigger picture of this in, in what I just was discussing a minute ago, just as, as, just as it is important to understand that Israel is Israel and the church is the church and they are not the same, the church did not replace Israel, Israel has not been cast away from God's plan, Israel is still important in God's plan. The mystery of the church was given, and we understand we're part of that church, but Israel still has a place in God's plan, and they yet future. So it's important to understand the distinction between Israel and the church. It's also important to understand the distinction between conditional and unconditional covenants. These things are critical in understanding the Scripture. There's a difference between conditional and unconditional covenants. A conditional covenant guarantees... That <coughs> Excuse me, that should be an unconditional covenant, right? Oh, no, I'm sorry. This is a conditional covenant. I'm sorry. Guarantees that God will do His part with absolute certainty when the human requirements are met. Yes, this is a conditional covenant. I'm sorry, I misread the thing. He will do His part with absolute certainty when the human requirements are met. But if man fails, God is not obligated to fulfill His covenant. So in other words, God makes the covenant. It is conditional upon man's faithfulness to do their part. If, they do, if man does not do his part then God does not, he has no obligation whatsoever to fulfill the covenant. An unconditional covenant, on the other hand, while it may include some human contingencies, is a declaration of the purpose of God, and the promises of an unconditional covenant will undoubtedly be fulfilled in God's perfect time and in his perfect way. Now we understand that. I'll give you a glimpse of what we're talking about here. God made an unconditional covenant to Israel that they would possess the land, the promised land as we refer to it. To date, they have never fully possessed that land because of their own disobedience, because of what they did. They, did nev they never did fully possess the land that God had promised them, but they will. There were times when God actually completely dispossessed them of the land, they, the Assyrian and Babylonian captivities because of the unfaithfulness of generations of Israelites. They were taken out of the land into captivity and then at some point were allowed to go back in. Now that does not change the fact that those particular generations did not enjoy possession of the land does not negate God's promise because His unconditional promise that they would have that land will come about. Whereas, see, with a conditional covenant, the thing about it is, if, if God had made a conditional covenant with them about the land, then we would have no idea. Maybe they'll have the land someday, maybe they won't. Maybe if Israel is finally faithful, they'll actually get the land. That's the difference between a conditional and unconditional covenant. In the case of an unconditional covenant, God absolutely will fulfill it, but a particular generation of, of individuals may not enjoy the promises or the provisions of that covenant. Does that make sense? We're going to talk about this more as we go through this. Even though the, the unconditional covenant absolutely will come true, certain generations may not experience them. The provisions of that, the benefits. Of the eight biblical covenants we're going to look at, only the Edenic and Mosaic covenants are conditional in nature. Only the Edenic and Mosaic covenants are conditional in nature. 
First of all, let's take a look at the Edenic covenant. It was the first covenant that God made with man. Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 through 31. And God said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. I should have given you a chance to turn there. Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 through 31. I'm praying that the Lord will help me to slow down a little bit. I went to a, we went to a wedding last night, and it was a great service, but the, the one who was uh, supervising or administering the, the marriage ceremony, if you will, he was, he was really fast. I mean, he's, I think he was even faster than I am, if you can imagine that. He was really fast. But here in Genesis chapter 1, we have verse 26, which I've already read, and then in 27, it says, God created man in his own image, and the image of God, he created him male and female, he created them. God blessed and multiplied them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every plant-yielding seed that is on the surface of all the earth and every tree which has fruit-yielding seed. It shall be food for you. And to every beast of the earth and every bird of the sky and to everything that moves on the earth which has life, I have given every green plant for food, and it was so. God saw all that he had made, and behold, it was very good, and there was evening, and there was morning the sixth day. Then we get to Genesis chapter 2. Flip over with me, if you will, to verses 16 and 17. I don't even have to flip the pages in my Bible. It's on the same, same page there. Verses 16 and 17 says, The Lord God commanded the man, saying, From any tree of the garden you may eat freely, but from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat from it you will surely die. So here's the covenant that we have. First of all, Adam, as part of this covenant, was given the responsibility of subduing the earth, having dominion over the animals and caring for the garden. So he was given this responsibility as part of the covenant that was made in the Garden of Eden. That's why we call it the Edenic covenant. It's in the Garden of Eden. He was also prohibited from eating of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. So he was given, God gave into his hand dominion over the earth, dominion over the animals, the carrying of the garden, but he was told not to eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. This was, this was a conditional covenant because God would give either life or blessing, excuse me, life and blessing, or death and cursing, depending on the faithfulness of Adam and actually Eve as well. Ultimately, it was all pinned on Adam. If you remember the whole incident, this is, this is not insignificant at all in your scriptures that she partook of the fruit, nothing happened. Then she gave it to him and he partook of the fruit and boom. Right when he partook of the fruit, that's when the consequences came down on them. Yes, sir? How is this different than the first theological covenant? Because the idea of the theological covenant is it's about works. And this actually has, first of all, they totally omit the idea of the responsibilities given to Adam in terms of taking care of all of that. They forget that in the covenant. And secondly, the idea of works, this is basically a matter of, a, of obedience or disobedience. He can't work or somehow earn his, uh, his uh, standing before God. It's a matter of this is put before him. And uh, they presented, that's one of the biggest, the biggest problems with it, is they presented as a covenant of works where he has to earn favor with God in order to somehow maintain his life forever. Instead, what we see here is that God has laid down the rules and said, okay, here's the deal. You have dominion over all of this. And by the way, it was easy to grow things in the garden. Remember, after the fall, it became toil. But in the garden, it was easy, man. You just put the seed down and it grows. You know, it all was easy to do. But the whole point was there was one condition and it was on obedience. And it had nothing to do with actual works at all. It was totally about obedience, whether they would obey the command of God or disobey. And so it varies differently in the idea of describing it as a covenant of works or whether it's about obedience to God. Does that make sense? Yeah, because basically it's the same thing that one works and one is doing what they're supposed to do. One is a matter of works and the other one is whether they're going to obey. That's right. It's a, a matter of disobedience that God the, made the consequence. Because Adam and Eve ate of the fruit, the penalty of death for their disobedience was imposed. First, spiritual death, because remember, on the day they ate of that tree, they died. But yet we see that physically they didn't die for years to come. 
Because what happened is on the day they ate of that tree, they died spiritually. And you can see that in the fact that they're hiding from God. Spiritual death is the idea that we have separation from God. Up until that point, they had nothing but intimacy with God. They fellowshiped with Him day after day after day. You know, they had this wonderful fellowship with God, but immediately after taking of the fruit of the tree, again, I still think it was a Washington apple, but we don't really know what it was. There's a lot of people still talk about the apple. They say it was an apple, but it, the Bible doesn't actually say. But after that, after that happened, they were afraid of God. They went and hid in the garden. Spiritual death occurred that day. Physical death came much later. Consequence. Now, actually, I'm going to throw you a little something just to chew on. We have always said, I've said it for years, that the idea was that as a consequence of the fall, uh, our bodies are now fallen, and the fallen bodies is what yields the physical death that we experience, is the fact that we have fallen bodies. If you look at the text of the Scriptures, when it talks about it, it actually gives you the idea that the reason that we now have physical death is because we are separated from the tree of life. Remember, inside the garden was the tree of life. And God said, I have to get you out of the garden because if I don't get you out of the garden and away from the tree of life, you might live forever. And so physical death, I believe, is a consequence of being separated from the tree of life that was in the garden. And we don't have access to the garden. Remember, it's, uh, it, was, it was guarded by the cherubim. We don't even know if the garden exists anymore after the flood. It may have been wiped out in the flood itself. But it was guarded by the cherubim so nobody could get in there to get access to the tree of life. And so physical death, I'm still chewing on this one, physical death may be a consequence of being separated from the tree of life, not a matter of having fallen bodies. Now, we do have fallen bodies. You know that, and I know that. (laughs) I know it every morning when I get up and I can barely walk on my knee. We know that we have fallen bodies, but it's possible that physical life, I mean, physical death, I should say, is actually a consequence of being separated from the tree. But nonetheless, that, they were, that was part of their punishment, was to be cast out of the garden, right? They were cast out of the garden, separated from the tree, so they died not only spiritually that day, but eventually they died physically. Now, the Adamic covenant, that's just for you to chew on, by the way. It's just one of those thinkers. The Adamic covenant was made af- with man after the fall. We see this in Genesis three fifteen through 19. It says, I will put enmity between you and the woman... And between your seed and her seed, we'll back up just a little bit here. He's talking to the serpent and he says, Because you have done this, cursed are you more than all cattle and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you will go and dust you will eat all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise you on the head and you shall bruise him on the heel. To the woman he said, I will greatly... Multiply your pain in childbirth, in pain you will bring forth children. Yet your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. Then to Adam he said, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife, and have eaten from the tree about which I commanded you, saying, You shall not eat from it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In toil you will eat of it all the days of your life. But both thorns and thistles it shall grow for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you will eat bread till you return to the ground. There's a picture of the idea of the death, right? Dust to dust, returning to the ground. Because from it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. So there we see the the Adamic covenant being laid out. The idea that it was an unconditional covenant because God basically declared with absolute certainty what man's new condition and circumstances would be once the fall of man had occurred. There was no condition involved. This is how it's going to be, period. A coming Redeemer is promised. We saw that. The seed of the woman promise. The seed of the woman promise that would come and crush the serpent. The woman is promised pain in childbirth. We have to infer from this, by the way, that there would not have been pain in childbirth if they had actually obeyed and been fruitful and multiplied prior to the fall that there would not have been pain in childbirth. But they didn't. There were no children born to Adam and Eve before the fall. So once the fall took place, God told them, you know, uh, here's what's going to happen. I will greatly multiply. He said to the woman, I will greatly multiply your pain in childbirth. You will, in pain you will bring forth children. So there we see the picture of it. Promise pain. 
The headship of man is also declared in that same verse. It says, your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. That's the first lesson in the headship of man, as if it wasn't already clear in the garden. It's made perfectly clear here that there, here's the headship of man. Yes? I believe that's the reason why the point that was made was is the reason why God came and declared the headship of man is because in, in the whole incident with the tree that Adam basically allowed her to kind of take control of the situation. She saw the tree was good for food and she took of it and she gave it to him and he ate, right? He basically was following rather than leading. And so I believe that's part of the reason that it's declared. It's, it's absolutely declared with certainty that this was what was going to happen because of the fact that things had kind of gotten turned around upside down. Uh, in that whole incident. That's a good point. Absolutely. The man has promised that producing food will now be difficult. It could have been done easier in the garden, but producing food will now be difficult, requiring toil and the sweat of his brow. We saw that in the verses 17 through 19. And man and woman learn that they will now face physical death. Again, whether that's because of their fallen bodies or because of the separation from the tree of life, that's something to contemplate and chew on. But nonetheless, God tells them with certainty that now that they, the fall has taken place, they will return to the dust. So physical death is now declared to them. They will die physically. They've already died spiritually and they will die physically. So this is a covenant that is unconditional because God does, there's no, there's no, there are no conditions here. It's just like this is how it will be. God laid down the, the, the rules for how their lives were going to be now that the fall had taken place. Questions or comments about that? So we have the Edenic covenant, right? And there was a condition placed on it in the terms of. Let me back up to that. There was conditions placed on it in terms of the, uh, in terms of their their uh, following or obeying his command not to partake of the tree. That was conditional. They failed. In that case, they failed. Here we have an unconditional covenant where God declares to man and woman, what their lives will now be like. And not only theirs, but also all their descendants after them. Then we have the Noahic covenant, which was made with Noah, his descendants, and all flesh that is on the earth. Let's read that from Genesis chapter 9, verses 1 through 18. Genesis chapter 9, verses 1 through 18. And God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. The fear of you and the terror of you will be on every beast of the earth and on every bird of the sky, with everything that creeps on the ground and all the fish of the sea. And to your hand they are given. Every moving thing that is alive shall be food for you. I give, it all, to you. I give all to you as I gave the green plant. Only you shall not eat flesh with its life, that is, its blood. Surely I will require your lifeblood. From every beast I will require it. And from every man, from every man's brother, I will require the life of a man. Life of man, excuse me. Whoever sheds man's blood by man, his blood shall be shed. That's a very important verse right there. For in the image of God he made man. As for you, be fruitful and multiply. Populate the earth abundantly and multiply in it. And God spoke to Noah and to his sons with him, saying, Now behold... I myself do establish my covenant with you and with your descendants after you and every living creature that is with you, the birds, the cattle, and every beast of the earth with you, of all that comes out of the ark, even every beast of the earth. I establish my covenant with you, and all flesh shall never again be cut off by the water of the flood, neither shall there again be a flood to destroy the earth. God said, This is the sign of the covenant which I am making between me and and you and every living creature that is with you. You notice that language. Between me and you and every living creature that is with you for all successive generations. I set my bow in the cloud for it shall be for a sign of a covenant between me and the earth. It shall come about when I bring a cloud over the earth that the bow will be seen in the cloud. And I will remember my covenant which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. And never again shall the water become a flood to destroy all flesh. When the bow is in the cloud, then I will look upon it to remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. 
Now you notice this language here. What does that tell you? The idea of remembering. We've learned about anthropomorphisms and anthropopathisms. This is descriptive language about how uh, this idea of the remembrance of God. That's a reminder to us, by the way, of this promise. And God said to Noah, This is the sign of the covenant which I have established between me and all flesh that is on the earth. Now the sons of Noah who came out of the ark were Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and Ham was the father of Canaan, and it goes on from there. So the rainbow, the promise of the rainbow, the sign of the covenant which was made with Noah, and all flesh for that matter. In the giving of this covenant, the normal order of nature is reaffirmed. Now we saw that in verse 2. Let me back up there. We saw that in verse 2. It says this idea of the fear of you and the terror of you will be on every, every beast of the earth, on every bird of the sky, with everything that creeps on the ground and all the fish of the sea. Into your hand they are given. This is the idea of man's dominion over all of the animal kingdom. We are not, no matter what science tries to tell you, we are not animals. We are separate from them. There's the animal kingdom and then there's man. God made us separate. In chapter 8, verse 22, it says, While the earth remains, and that's very important, right, because it will be destroyed, while the earth remains, seed time and harvest, and cold and heat, and summer and winter, and day and night shall not cease. This is a promise also that the normal order of things, the normal order of nature, is confirmed and reaffirmed. Man is now given permission to eat of the flesh of the animals. We see that in verses 3 and 4 that we looked at. The idea its very subtle there, but it says, Every moving thing that is alive shall be food for you. I give all to you as I, gri as I gave the green plant. Only you shall not eat flesh with its life, that is, its blood. Now, do you, re you recall in our reading we had just this past week that the Israelites took and they killed the, they killed the animals and they ate, including the blood. Do you remember that in the First Samuel passages we were just reading in the Bible reading this week? They ate the meat along with the blood and they were told not to do that. They were told not to eat the blood with the animal and they did it anyway. Well, here's the idea of the... The not eating of the blood as well. And then it goes on from there. But here's the giving of the, the ability to go ahead and eat the flesh of animals. I'm thankful for that. Every time I eat a steak, I'm thankful for that. Human government, I mean, we all are, right? We love, we love that. Human government is established as a means to curb sin with man receiving the authority from God to execute capital punishment. That's in verses 5 and 6. Surely I will require your lifeblood from every beast I will require it. And from every man, from every man's brother, I will require the life of man. Whoever sheds man's blood, by man his blood shall be shed. And again, that's very important. The whole reason for in the image of God he made man. And by the way, I believe that message at the end. For in the image of God he made man. I believe, my faith conviction is that applies to both the murdered and the murderer. Clearly the murdered. It definitely applies to the murdered, right? When you kill another man, you've killed someone who is made in the image of God. But the one who committed the act is also made in the image of God. And he's held accountable for what he did because he's been made in the image of God. I think it applies to both. But the vivid picture is that you killed somebody who was made in the image of God. You know, so you're going to pay for that. That's the vivid, the vivid picture is the one who was killed. The command to be fruitful and multiply is restated here. Twice, Genesis 9, 1 and again in 9, 7. Be fruitful, multiply and fill the earth. See that also in verse 7. As for you, be fruitful and multiply, multiply, populate the earth abundantly and multiply in it. Now what's fascinating is we see this command to be fruitful and multiply repeated in the scriptures over and over again. It's given more than once. You notice how like when we were studying the covenant, the Abrahamic covenant, how it was reaffirmed to Isaac and then to Jacob. The reaffirming of the covenant, it was restated for them and told that, that they, were, they were the ones who the covenant would go through them. Well, interestingly, this, this command of God, this command to be fruitful and multiply was given over and over again in Scripture. It was given before the fall. It was given after the fall. It's given here after the flood. But fascinatingly, when you get to us today in the church, we are never given this command. And yet when God reaffirms this over and over again as the circumstances and conditions change, he talked to Abraham and said, your descendants will be like the sand of the seashore. You know, that there would be this great multiplication of his descendants. But yet when we get to the church, the dispensation in which we live, we are not given this command. 
And part of the reason for that is our command is as you go, make disciples. And that's how we multiply. As a church, we multiply as we lead others to Christ, or as we work with God, obviously, in leading others to Christ. And as we make disciples, that's how we multiply in a different way. So this command is interesting that it's given over and over again, but never given to us. God promised that he would never again cut off all flesh by flood and never again destroy the earth. And we looked at that. But that's promise given to all flesh. It's fascinating because we often think of this covenant as being given to Noah and his sons. And it was. But it's actually a promise that God made to all flesh. All the animals on earth have been given a promise of God that he will never again destroy the earth by water and never destroy it. Because remember, you know, there were, the, there were the beasts that were taken of the field, the birds and whatever else, you know, that were taken and put into the, uh, into the ark, those that were preserved in the ark. But there were many animals that died in the flood. Many, many animals died in the flood. And in fact, you can go, if you go up to certain places, you can see these places where their bones are all collected together in certain areas. But anyway, I'll let you figure out what I'm talking about. But the idea is that, the idea is that there's evidence of the great flood. If you look at archaeology, there's, there's tremendous evidence of the great flood. And God promised, I won't ever do that again. I'm not going to do that again. So the promise was not only to mankind, but also to the beasts of the field. Any questions or comments about we've gone, gone, what we've gone through so far? We've looked at three different covenants of the eight we're going to look at. We've looked at the Edenic, the Adamic, and the Noahic covenants. Yes? yes this is an unconditional. Absolutely. And the rainbow is the symbol for that? It's the sign. The rainbow is the sign of this unconditional covenant of God. He has made a promise of what He will not do. Right? Certain things are, certain things are given as part of this, this covenant. But overall, we have the promise of God that he will never destroy the earth again by water. He will do it with fire, though. That day's coming when he will destroy the earth with fire. But he won't do it with water ever again. Although we wouldn't mind having some local flooding again if we had some more rain. All right, we've been blessed with some rain here lately, and we're thankful for it. And, and some local flooding wouldn't be necessarily a bad thing. But there won't be an earth, earth-wide, worldwide flood. And we are already, I tell you what, instead of trying to, since it's a communion Sunday, instead of trying to force ourselves into looking at the Abrahamic covenant, it's too important. By the way, we're going to look at the Abrahamic covenant in this study, but we're really looking at it at the 10,000 foot level. Might not be the 20,000 foot level, but we're looking at it at the 10,000 foot level. You could spend a month of Sundays studying the Abrahamic covenant all by itself. We're going to just do an overview of it so we have a good picture of what the Abrahamic Covenant's all about, Lord willing, starting next week. So we'll come back to the Abrahamic Covenant. We need to have a clear understanding of this covenant and the associated covenants. Can anybody tell me the associated covenants with the Abrahamic Covenant? Does anybody know what they are without looking in your notes? That's cheating. (laughs) Abrahamic Covenant, you have three covenants that go hand in hand with the Abrahamic Covenant. What's that? Well, that's true, the coming of Christ, but that's actually, uh, that's actually one of the things that fulfills the promises of even the going, all the way back to the, going all the way back to the Adamic covenant with the, with the coming of Christ. There's three specific covenants, yeah? Well, the Mosaic covenant was affiliated with it, but it actually doesn't reaffirm the, the, it does not reaffirm the elements of the Abrahamic covenant. You have the Davidic covenant... That's, that, that is a, a, a covenant that is basically a reaffirming of the promises of the Abrahamic covenant. You have what's known as either the Palestinian or the land covenant that is a reaffirming of the covenant with Abraham. And then you have one more, which is the new covenant. So those three covenants, Palestinian or land, the Davidic covenant, and then the new covenant are all three covenants that are tied into the Abrahamic covenant. So it's important for us to understand the Abrahamic Covenant, before we see those. So we'll come back and we'll look at the Abrahamic Covenant next Sunday morning, Lord willing. Rapture pending. Let's go ahead and close in prayer since we are uh, running out of time this morning. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for the time of study that we've had here this morning, the opportunity to look at several covenants, the promises that you have made and the things which we know will be carried out. We thank you for our opportunity to once again look at the 
Garden of Eden and the fall that took place there and the reminder of, of the ramifications of that to all of the Adamic race. And we're thankful that you did not leave us helpless as a fallen race, but instead you had mercy on us. And even while we were yet sinners, you sent your son Jesus Christ to die for us. And we thank you that because our sins have been placed upon him and because he died for us, we now can have eternal life through nothing more than faith in him. And Father, we thank you that today we will have the opportunity to partake of communion and be reminded of the wonderful sacrifice that's been made on our behalf. Father, we thank you for the lesson that we had today to teach us about the promises that were made to Noah and his sons and all the beasts of the field and also the things that were proclaimed after the fall of man. And we know that you are faithful. You will carry all these things out to perfection. And we ask that we would be even somewhat faithful in our walk with you, that we would, we know that we cannot be faithful the way you can be faithful, Father, but we ask that you would help us be somewhat faithful, that we might indeed image Jesus Christ to this lost and dying world. Father, it is such a delight to study your promises in the Scriptures. As we learn more and more about them, it helps us learn more and more about you. And Father, we know we will never be able to measure up to you completely measure up to your standard of righteousness, but we know that your son Jesus Christ did, and we know that we are in Christ because of our faith in him. We just consider it to be a glory. It is a glory to us that we're able to worship you and praise you and step into the throne room and pray and all the things that you allow us to do as your fellow workers. We just thank you so much for all that you do for us through our Savior Jesus Christ. And it's in his most precious and holy name that we pray. Amen.